All right, good day, everyone. Uh, welcome to this edition of Aerospace Live. My name is Bob Roberts, and I'm with the Civil Air Patrol, and I hope you're all having a great day. Now, we have an awesome guest for us today. Now, he has flown F-18s, he's flown F-16s, 737s, you name it, he's probably flown it. Now, he gets to fly with a white shirt and stripes on his shoulder nowadays when he's flying corporate. Now, he's also an author of a book series called Spectre. Uh, he's recently started flying helicopters because I guess why not? And when he's bored from doing all that, he's a successful YouTube channel where he has introduced a huge audience to aviation in a fun and engaging way. Now, in the show notes and descriptions down below, you can find links to his media empire. Now, welcome C.W. Lemoyne, who is also known by his aviation handle, Mover. Hey, Mover, how you doing? What's up, Fuzzy? Thanks for having me. You know, it's funny is uh, you're the first guest where I've actually put a handle on your name. <laughs> and uh, well, we call him Call Sign. So <laughs> call that, you sign. <laughs> you're not a trucker. <laughs> and um i have i you know i think there's very few people in civil air patrol that actually know <laughs> that i go by fussy um, is there a story behind it there is i don't know if it's something i'm allowed to say on air okay. right. <laughs> so, skip, it. skip it for the night it's got the bar story it is a bar story um it's actually a pretty good one too but it's definitely not this logo in the back of this screen here cannot be here when i tell that story so um <laughs> So, um, but no, I, I've never had that before, but Hey, if you've got a handle, I've got a handle. <laughs> so, there you go. um, so for those that don't know you, um, you go by CW Lemoyne. And like I said, you, you started flying with, um, you know, the air force and then you went to the Navy and then you came back to the air force. Uh, cause I, you know, I don't know how many people actually have done that. Leave the air force, go to the Navy. Does that happen a lot? Uh, I think that's uncommon. I think it's even it's uncommon to go Air Force to Navy. That's pretty uncommon. And yeah. I think it's even more uncommon to do Air Force, Navy back to the Air Force. Um, most people go Navy to Air Force. That's the most common one. You see a bunch of mm -hmm. guys getting off active duty Navy, guys or girls, active duty Navy, going to the Guard, going to the Reserves. Um, but you rarely see someone go in the opposite direction. It's happened. There's a couple, but there are very few. Now, why did you why did you first pick because you had Air Force the Navy? Just out of curiosity, why did you choose Air Force? Like when you were younger, what got you to the Air Force versus say Navy or why Air Force at all? Well, I mean, so my dad was Army Army Guard, and you know when I was a kid growing up, and I was told, "Hey, you'll never be a fighter pilot because your vision's too bad." Uh, <laughs> I was going to go to the Air Force Academy, and my optometrist said, "No, you don't have twenty twenty vision. It's impossible. You know, crush your dreams." So I did. And then my dad was like, well, why don't you try the guard uh, when I was in college? Because I got my private pilot's license and I was really getting back into flying. And I went to uh, the guard unit in New Orleans because that's where I was going to Tulane. And they said, well, you need to enlist. You need to be a crew chief. And I said, well, I'm on a scholarship. I can't. I don't want to do that. And it just so happened um, I, I, there was a website called – it used to be called baseops.net. I think now it's called flyingsquadron.com. And uh, there was information on the hiring process. And one of the guys said, hey, I've got the uh, DO, the director of operations. I've got his contact information if you want it. So I cold called the guy and I'm a junior in college. And I said, hey, sir, I want to be a fighter pilot. How do I do this? And he's like, yeah, you're too young, man. Just come back when you're, you're eligible. And it just so happened a few days later, the, uh, I was working in the gym at Tulane. Actually, this might have been a few months later. But um, the ROTC commander, their flight commander, happened to know me because I had done a little bit of ROTC. Um, and he said, hey, you know this, uh, this major over at the base? And I said, yeah. He's like, hey, he wants to offer you a job. And I'm like, he wants to offer me a job? What are you talking about? So I went over there, and he's like, yeah, man, you know, I loved your enthusiasm. We'll hire you as a student hire. So I was a GS3, and I was working for an A-10 squadron while I was in college and working on the simulator and stuff. And then uh, the base realignment and closure happened, and the, they closed, but um, it was supposed to be 2009. This is way back in 2005. Uh, but then Katrina happened, and that accelerated it to, hey, we're, gonna, we're never bringing jets back here. Mm -hmm. So I went to OTS with a pilot slot, and then they came back and said, if you don't find another unit, you're, you're done. It's over. You're not going to go to pilot training. So I started cold calling you know, while I'm at OTS. You know, Major OT Major LeMoyne reports <laughs> to ask a question. And um, I called up uh, uh, Carswell and Homestead, where the two reserve uh, fighter units around. And um, Carswell had just hired somebody. So Homestead brought me out uh, after I graduated. And I interviewed, and they liked me, and they sent me to pilot training. So they sponsored me. So um, I, as far as um, 
I mean, taking that back a little bit, I ended up getting a waiver for vision and stuff like that. The unit sponsored me. So even though the optometrist told me it's impossible, well, I mean, it turned out it wasn't. And I went to uh, Brooks and got the waiver and all that, which is now right, Pat, for the kids at home that are wondering. It's all done at right, Pat, now. But um, that that whole process, you know, that's what was local. And what I had learned for the Guard and Reserves is you get hired and that's where you fly. So I, when I was looking at the Academy or ROTC, especially ROTC, because at this point I'd kind of forgotten about the vision thing. And I, I did ROTC a little bit, but I was a junior. Uh, that had transferred. So I, I didn't have a good shot because I hadn't been in the, the little squadron that long to get a pilot slot. And the second thing is they couldn't guarantee that I was going to be a fighter pilot. They couldn't guarantee that I was going to be a pilot or anything. They said, well, you put your preference sheet and whatever ends up working out needs of the Air Force and stuff. And I was like, Ooh, that's scary. I don't know if I, I, don't know if I can do that. <laughs> that's scary. And so I, I knew from research about the guard and the reserves and stuff. And I knew I wanted to be in Louisiana. So I was like, yeah, let me uh, go apply to these units. And like I said, the F-15 that, you know, it just didn't work out at the time and the A-10 did. And so, you know, Air Force Reserve, the Navy um, doesn't have that program. So there's no, a lot of people ask me that haven't been in the Navy Reserve. You can't go off the street to a Navy Reserve unit and go to pilot training sponsored like you can in the Air Force Reserve or the Guard. You have to be a rated prior uh, qualified fighter pilot, for example, to go to the Hornet squadron or whatever. So it's a little bit different how they do it. So the, really the good deal is the guard and reserve for stuff like that. Now, so when you went, so the airplanes that you were flying, so was it, once you got past your, your initial pilot training, was it the F-16 that the airplane you were flying? Yeah. So, um, pilot training, OTS, all that stuff, exactly the same as active duty. I mean, I was in class with active duty. It's all the same process. Uh, I graduated with uh, good friends of mine, you know, that were active duty, uh, went to the F-16 uh, basic course at Luke Air Force Base, all active duty. You know, they treat us the same. Then once you're done all your initial, they call it pipeline training because it's a pipeline. It's, you know, you start out as a nobody and then you become a second lieutenant and then you get your wings. When you get back to your squadron, that's when things start to change. So I flew down at Homestead. We had Block 30. Uh, F-16s, which uh, 1986 to 88 models, uh, roughly. But the nice thing about the Guard and Reserve is because if they're unit equipped, so if the unit owns the aircraft, uh, they have what, they have their own uh, test center out at Tucson. So they actually upgrade the aircraft to very high standards. So the, mm-hmm. the jets, even though you're like, ah, 86 to 88, they've got a lot of cool toys. They're very well-equipped aircraft that you're flying and they're just as good as their active duty counterparts, just different. Yeah, that's nice. So you don't have to worry about, especially if you're a fighter pilot. I mean, you got to think about, you could have to use this thing someday for real. So, yeah. you know, I mean, you don't want to, you don't want to be the, you know, the, the second, the second tier team showing up with some lumbering, you know, airplane that's just not going to compete, you know, and, and putting yourself at risk. So um, yeah. that's nice that they don't have that issue. And in some cases, it's even better because, you know, the constraints on, you know, the Block 40, 50, which is limited by the test cycle and the upgrade process that the big Air Force has, the Guard and Reserve, if there's an update, they can push it out, you know, within a couple months, which Mm -hmm. is unheard of, you know. So you can get some really nice toys fairly quickly uh, that maybe, you know, you might even be ahead of the active duty counterparts uh, as far as, you know, flying some of the nicer stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got a chance to spend a lot of time at the Tucson, Arizona base because um, I work out with uh, Raytheon. And mm-hmm. so I got a chance to work uh, with, you know, there. And it was really fun all day long to see the, the the guard just flying in and out of there all day long. It was, you know, it was a nice it was a nice view out the window. <laughs> uh, while yeah, those sit- guys are um, that's the foreign uh, training center. So that's the foreign B course, if you will. They, they integrate with like the Dutch. Uh, and our foreign partners uh, to train those fighter pilots to go back and, and fly the F-16. So that's a really cool mission that they've got. Yeah, they usually have a lot of cool stuff coming in um, when they're mm-hmm. out, out having some fun. Now, now you also, now when you were in the Navy side, you were flying F-18s, right? Yep, yep. And in this case, everything I said about having the nice toys that, that <laughs> you gone. have does not apply. I mean, <laughs> we were... We were, uh, so VFA-204, shore-based adversary squadron, uh, although VFA means it, it is fighter attack. So, I mean, it could technically be part of the strategic reserve, but we were flying A-pluses, a, a, a pluses, 
So um, older aircraft, uh, pretty much we just did red air, uh, so adversary air. So that means we would go out um, against uh, people training and mm -hmm. give them presentations to, to play against, you know, so to give mm -hmm. them something um, that represents something they might face in combat, you know, to train them uh, to go to war. Now, you know, it's funny, you, um, I just have this envisionment. So you started talking the story, you started talking about how young you were, uh, you know, you started working, uh, you know, and getting some experience, getting to know. And again, this, you know, I try to say this all the time to people, aviation, whether it's military, general aviation, corporate, it is not a big community. Like, yeah. you know, who, you know, it is a small community. So one, you know, don't be a jerk. Because yeah, don't be a dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> people are gonna yeah. know. <laughs> it's yeah. gonna get around pretty quick. Um, you know, so be that. Be that. You know, especially for our, our cadets that listen. You know, be the one that's energetic. Like that's what I'm hearing you say, right? You were energetic. You were optimistic. You you know you kept pushing forward. Um, you know you you weren't a jerk. I don't think you know. Uh, but people kind of got a good positive feeling for you, yeah. um, and that turned into an opportunity. And um, so, you know, the other thing that's funny too, is I mean, you're hearing that story. I had this picture in my mind um, from Iron Eagle. I'm like, oh my God, this is the kid from Iron Eagle. Like he, just, <laughs> he's, he's, he works, he's exactly, you know, only people our age are probably going to even understand that reference. <laughs> um, so anybody, anybody under our age, please go look up Iron Eagle, but not, not two, just, just one. <laughs> so don't worry. Ah, two, two has got its own, it's funny in its own right. <laughs> two, two, two is good for like one of those uh, 80s popcorn nights. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but you know, but it's the same thing, you know, just, just be around aviation. You know, if this is something, cause like so many people say, how do I get involved in aviation? The answer is get involved in aviation. So, yeah. um, well, you know, and, and to that point, you know, going back, um, to my college time, um, I did a little bit of time in the civil air patrol, not a whole lot, but, right. um, when I was doing ROTC, did we kick uh, you out? The, Cause I'm going to look up your service record. <laughs> no, for the, for the six to nine weeks that I was actually in ROTC, mm -hmm. um, the debt commander was, I think, uh, he was, I forgot what his affiliation was, but he was very active in the New Orleans civil air patrol. Oh, cool. So, so I went out to a meeting with him and stuff and, you know, I was looking into it and I never actually flew with him or, or did anything because around that time I ended up going to the, the air force reserve squadron mm -hmm. and getting a job as a GS three or whatever. But that, that's to your point though, had I never done ROTC, mm -hmm. I never would have gotten the other opportunity because, because they knew me. And even though it didn't necessarily work out, you know, I didn't mm -hmm. become a cadet and didn't do all that stuff. I had made those contacts. And right. when somebody's like, Hey, you know, that Lemoyne kid. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I know him. I know how to get in touch with him. I mean, if he, if he just said no, that'd have been the end of it. I wouldn't be sitting here. Right. So putting yourself in the situations and, you know, I, I talk about it on the, my channel is the make them tell you no mindset, because yes. if you, if you are the, uh, if you let self doubt creep into your, your mentality and you go, well, I can't be a fighter pilot. I just can't, or I can't be an airline pilot, or I can't, uh, make rank in, in the civil air patrol, or I can't progress. Mm -hmm. y you've already lost. You've mm -hmm. defeated yourself before you even try. And if I had stopped at an optometrist telling me you'll never be a pilot, period. I mean, she didn't just say you won't be a fighter pilot. She said I wouldn't be a professional pilot. I wouldn't mm -hmm. be an airline pilot. I wouldn't be a fighter pilot. And look, I've, you know, I've done both of those things. Mm -hmm. And so the people that succeed, you know, when I say make them tell you no, it's not that you want the answer to be no. It's just that don't be you don't tell yourself no. Let them do it. You know, make it their problem. So. You just have to keep pushing forward and pushing ahead. And that's that's to your point of it's the enthusiasm. It's the, hey, I've got I've got the attitude. I, uh, my mentor, the one that actually hired me, I still talk to him to this day. Uh, what he said that got him was he could see the spark. He could mm -hmm. see the fire when he talked to me. You know, when when you know, when he when he looked at me across from him in his office, he could see that 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 vigor that, you know, that zest for for in getting into the squadron and aviation and stuff. And that will carry you a long way. Yeah, I got a buddy of mine, not to change the topic to somebody else, but I got a buddy of mine. Um, he was told similar things. You know, he was, uh, he was too small, um, you know, and all this other stuff. And he was really, really small as a child. But um, I think he actually had something. I don't know what it was, but he was pretty small. But everybody was telling him no. And like you said, man, you know, make him tell you no, you know. 
And, and so he started working as, um, on the fuel line, just helping the fuel airplanes while he got to know some of the corporate pilots and then all, you know, the single, single pilot corporate pilots. And so, um, one of, one of the guys is actually in civil air patrol up in Rochester, New York. And one of the guys up there fly, you know, flies corporate flies, um, uh, King airs. And he's like, Hey, you know, come jump in the airplane. I got to go to, uh, Atlanta, you know, we'll stop off through DC and you, know, you can hang out the day with me. Right. And that, that was, uh, that was the start of his career. He now flies 747s. <laughs> so, yeah. well, um, and, and that's, that's what it takes. And, you know, just to just like the civil air patrol, um, you know, just starting out, getting your qualifications. I mean, being in a position where, yeah, you might start out and it's not that great. You mm-hmm. know, you might be in something that, you know, you feel like, well, I'm too good for this. Well, you're, first of all, you're not. And <laughs> second, true. um, you know, it, it, it's not about what task is at hand. It's how you approach it and how you right. attack it. And if you can have that mentality that even if it's something small, like sweeping the floors versus pre-flighting an aircraft versus doing the mission, if you attack everything with that same mindset, people will take notice and they'll put you in a position to succeed. They'll help you succeed. Yeah. It's the, uh, you know, it's the, um, they say excellence, right? So in the air force yeah. and civil air patrol, right? It's one of the, the common. So they say excellence, excellence, in everything you do. So whether you're sleeping, yeah. the, like you said, whether you're sleeping the floor, it just shows that attitude. Um, and that's the attitude you need. Now, now you, you actually mentioned it earlier, so I, I can change the question a little bit. So you got your <laughs> private pilot before you went into the military. So yeah. what, how, what age did you start flying? Cause that must've been pretty, pretty early. Yeah. So, I mean, I took a, my, my mom died when I was 13. Um, and I took a couple of lessons after that. My dad was like trying to get me engaged and stuff. And I was too young, you know, I was 14 years old at the time. And, you know, you, you can't, I was still a couple of years away from being able to legally get my license and solo. So we kind of shelved that. And then I picked it back up, uh, when I was 18, uh, I was working in college at the, so the way I did college, I did a two year community college, uh, mm-hmm. on the state scholarship. And then I applied for a legislative scholarship, um, to go to Tulane. So, oh, cool. you know, it's not like Tulane's one of those places where you're either super rich or you got a scholarship. And I was <laughs> the one with the scholarship. I wasn't the one uh, that was paying uh, the, the uh, tuition there. But so I was working uh, in a hospital. And uh, ironically, I what what prompted me was I wrecked my car. I actually put my car in a ditch and mm-hmm. I felt and it wasn't because it was wet or cold or, you know, icy or whatever. I was hot dogging and being an idiot. <laughs> and I was so mad at myself for doing that, you know, because I had to pay to fix it, that, you know, the money I had left, you know, from saving up because I was living at home, I was like, I need to I need to make myself better. I need to prove that I'm not that guy that's going to put a car in a ditch. So I called the FBO and I said, hey, what's the going rate for, uh, you know, flight lessons and stuff? And back in my day, God, this is going <laughs> to this is going to take me, you know, a Cessna 152 was Forty nine or forty eight dollars an oh hour. Oh my gosh, those gays and, are gone. And, and the instructor was like twenty or twenty five. Yep. And so you know we crammed in. You know I'm six one. He was probably six three, six. Well, he's probably six three. Yep. We were. I. We never officially did a weight and balance. It's probably <laughs> better that we didn't. Um, sucking fuel out of the wing. Yeah, it was it was kind of sketchy, but. Uh, it was winter time, so that helped, you know, winter in Louisiana. But uh, I soloed on my 19th birthday, and um, oh, cool! I, I, you know, probably uh, it was like May, I think, that I got my license. And uh, one of those things, uh, the other screw up in that was that I did not take the written very seriously because this was oh. a was it a Part 61? Part 61? Yeah, yeah, 61 is the, is the Part FBO, 61 yeah. So he really didn't. He's like, you know, here you go, you know, go take your written. There wasn't a lot of Hey, dude, this is actually a pretty push it up test. You might want to yeah. prepare and stuff. So I, you know, flipped through it the night before and said, yeah, you know, I'm <laughs> like in college. This will be fine. I missed it by one question. So the, uh, I mean, so I had to go retake the, the stupid thing. And, you know, the second time I got like, you know, 98 or 99 or whatever, but, um, it, 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 it humbled me, you know, it humbled me. Cause I, you know, I thought this would come easy. And, and the, the point I'm, making with that is that you never take anything for granted in aviation because mm-hmm. it's not like anything else you've ever done. You know, even though you can make straight A's in, in college and never have to study, it's different. You know, yeah. it's, it's different and, you know, they're going to they're going to make it different and try to challenge you. So 
Um, I did that. And then when I went to college, I was flying, you know, I, that it's just like you're talking about. I got to know people, Mm -hmm. you know, I got to know a really awesome guy. He had, um, a a Pitts. He had a Giles 202. He had an L39. Oh, wow. Um, this guy had some money. He had a a Cessna 310. So I'm like, man, you know, and it's a lot of times you just be like, Hey, split the gas now on a, S2, that's okay. You know, I got my tailwheel in the S2. In an L39, I was say, not the L39. Bit, yeah, a little bit different. But it goes back to your point of, you know, if you, if you can make yourself available to these opportunities and then make yourself marketable. You know, I helped him make a website for his business and stuff like that. So, I mean, it doesn't, you don't have to refuel the plane. There's other stuff you can do. Uh, it's just networking. You know, and that guy with the L39 too, you know, assuming that was a, a tandem front back, right? Or yeah. It, yeah. So that guy probably would get just as big a kick out of seeing the eyes light up on somebody that he's taking up as the person in the airplane whose eyes are lit up. Um, I know a yeah. lot of pilots that just, they love sharing aviation. Um, yeah. you, you know, so asking, I do this all the time. Like I see somebody out at the airport and they got you know, some really good airplane, you know, see, you're talking about the, the size I'm, I'm six foot eight. So oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, um, <laughs> I, I have a funny story. I usually tell folks, um, you know, I had a, I had to move a 150 one time. Um, mm-hmm. you know, they just asked me to help them move it to a maintenance facility. And so the airplane was so small for me. It was really one of the first times I've ever flown something that small. And I, I literally, I could, I could fly it like you would ride a bicycle. I could just lean <laughs> To one side or the other. Lean, open the door. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. And then, and then I couldn't, um, you know, I, I'm not going to say who the FBO was because I don't want them getting mad at me because they would have been like, why did you take off? You know, um, but uh, I couldn't pull the yoke back because the yoke was hitting my knees. And so I put my left foot on the left rudder, my right foot on the right rudder, left yoke, right yoke. And then I sat in the middle between and I put those seatbelt across <laughs> and I just flew, wow. I flew like this. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So that would be backward feet, right? So if your left foot now controls the right rudder. And no, 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 no. Le- yeah, I, my legs are long enough that I could, oh, I could split across. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> oh, so, but I, I'm not kidding. I literally found out that I could, I could lean into it. And I could, I could shift the center of gravity enough where I could, you know, not major moves, but I could do little yeah. movements with this <laughs> anyways. Um, wow. so many stories with the little airplanes with me, but anyways, um, now, what, what, did, what did you learn how to fly in? That was a 152. 152? Okay, yeah, so you had the, the smaller airplane. Um, for the folks that, now, a 152, and I just mentioned a 150. So what's the difference between a 152 and a 150 for the folks that? Oh, God, uh, you're asking me general aviation questions now. <laughs> I think one of them, uh, what is the 150's got the light, the, the Continental engine? Yeah, yeah. It's, do, they, do they both have Continental engines? No, nah, you can, you, uh, you can get light combing and Continental, yeah, you can get both. Yeah, um, I don't yeah, remember. Yeah, I, it's just different horsepower. I don't know. I, somebody out there right now is commenting. Well, you get the comments I, I on YouTube. I didn't know there was going to be a test. Yeah. This so was, somebody right uh, now is like, a 152 has this and a 150 has it. You know, somebody right now is commenting. But anyways. <laughs> um, older, older. I did fly a 150. Uh, probably my worst instructor story was in, was in a 150 in college. And the guy was just, oh boy, he was. Well, yeah. what's that story? We got to hear that story. Can you tell uh, it? I, it, I mean, it, it's really nothing huge. It was, you know, there's a thunderstorm rolling in and I'm like, are we really, should we really be flying, you know, with the <laughs> thunderstorm, like two miles from the field? And he's like, ah, it'll be, it'll be fine. Yeah. So I get in, you know, and I, I've been flying 152s, you know, so I get in, I start going through the flows and doing all that stuff. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. And he's like, I've got 20,000 hours in military aircraft. What do you <laughs> think you're doing? And I'm like. I'm starting this thing because you you're we're going flying and it's raining you yeah. know i mean the thunderstorm's right there yeah we gotta like, go no 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 here you go and he pulls this big laminated checklist out yep. and he's like you don't skip the checklist you know do this i'm like okay <laughs> all right you know he's like and so i i start you know like bam flow and he's like no stop you know one little thing and it was like it turned into like a check ride you know this it yeah. was supposed to just be a checkout in a 150 and it turned out to be this real you know like like passive aggressive, almost aggressive check ride. I'm like, God, this guy's awful. I don't want to fly here anymore. <laughs> no way. Yeah. But, so he had the authoritarian style. So, yeah. so now uh, going back to the military. Um, so I got to know. So you're one of the few people out there that have flown both F-16s and F-18s. I have a very clear favorite. People that know me know my favorite. 
Um, what was your favorite? Well, actually, the two so two parts of this question. So one, what was more fun to fly? And then two, which one was more badass? Oh, boy. Uh, this is a very common question, and I always uh, defer slightly because the standard fighter pilot answer is it depends. Mm -hmm. and, it, the and there's no better place where it, it, it applies than the Hornet and the, the F-16. You know, we, we call it the Viper. Mm -hmm. It's officially the Fighting Falcon. Everybody calls it the Viper that's flown it. Um, <clears throat> the Viper... I mean, we 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 fly clean, you know, so nothing on the pylons, you know, just a couple uh, concrete AIM-120s and an AIM-9X trainer uh, missile, and it would hurt you. I mean, it would, you know, it had a greater than a one-to-one -one thrust to weight ratio. Yep. You could power your way out of anything, pull nine Gs and hold nine Gs. In fact, if you got below ten thousand feet uh, in full uh, afterburner, you could actually start accelerating at nine Gs. So you'd be at wow. nine Gs and for those that are new to, um, you know, the aerodynamics and the uh, of of flying, when you pull G's, typically you bleed off because it's increasing your drag and the, the the you don't have the thrust to overcome it. So you know you pull nine G's and then you know you get on, on the backside of the power curve and you slow down. Above a certain speed, the F-16 would have excess power and it would just keep accelerating. I mean, wow. you'd you'd have to modulate the throttle because you just the engines just produce so much thrust. So that was nice, although, you know, physically it kind of, you know, it hurt because, you know, you're talking nine times the force of gravity on your body. Mm -hmm. um, the F-18 was more of a gentleman's aircraft. Mm -hmm. So you go out and dogfight and you never, it's a seven and a half G limit. You rarely go over six, six and a half because it's a slow speed fighter. So slow speed means, you know, you can point your nose and, you know, you're just kind of, you're enjoying it because it's not as hard on, on, on your joints and your neck and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But the F-16, you could power your way out of stuff. So if I got slow in an F-16 and I kind of messed up, I could just go, okay, unload, get the blower back in. I've got my energy back. The Hornet, once you traded it in, it didn't have anything. You're just falling. I mean, you're done. There's there's no way to get it back. Um, so, you know, as far as which is more fun, I really enjoyed the Hornet because having flown the F-16 for so long and – you know, you, you, you're you used to pulling nine Gs and you're used to, you know, dogfighting being this very physical, very intense thing. Mm -hmm. You go to the Hornet and you're like, wow, I'm I'm winning and it doesn't hurt. And this is fun <laughs> watching a jet, you know, because you get into some weird situations where the jet's just like, you're like, how did I get into this? This is awesome because uh, <laughs> it's, it's just so impressive for what the aircraft can do. But um, it's it's almost not a fair comparison because I flew the really, really old a models, mm -hmm. which didn't have the avionics and stuff. I thought, you know, when you talk it talk about basic, we call it pilot vehicle interface PVI. When you talk a basic, just how you interface with the jet, the F-16 was way better because you just sit there and you had your hand on throttle uh, and stick, and everything you wanted to do, you could just go through the menus and stuff and and do what you needed to do. Um, but in the Hornet, it's kind of a mix and mm -hmm. having, it's always the law of primacy. What you learn first is what you're used to. So the stick was just close enough, but not quite. So some of the stuff you'd be like, oh, this should do this. Like, nope, sure doesn't, doesn't do that at all. This changes the display versus, you know, selecting a target and stuff like that. So it's just different. Um, I know people that have flown both. Usually people will love what they've flown first. Mm -hmm. Uh, Hornet guys go to the Viper and they're like, yeah, the Hornet's, you know, a, a better aircraft. I tr tend to trend toward the F-16 because, you know, it's the first thing I flew, but, uh, I loved them both. I mean, there was, there was no time in either of them where I'm like, God, this sucks. Mm -hmm. I hate both of these air, you know, I wish I didn't have to, but, uh, it's just different. It's different. Um, and, and it's all in what you get used to. All right, N nice, nice political answer. So you didn't yeah. make, See? make make uh, half half the aviation true, community mad I mean, at you. <laughs> it, it is absolutely true. I mean, I, I love airplanes, right? Mm -hmm. So I go fly the F sixteen. I'm having a great time. I love flying the F sixteen. Um, you know, I go fly the Hornet. Love flying the Hornet. Uh, if you want to talk about different services. Mm -hmm. Then you're getting into, you know, if I could combine the two and say, you know, I take all the good stuff from the Navy and all the good stuff from the Air Force and then combine them and make one super, you know, DOD branch of just flying and doing awesome things. That's yep. what I would do because uh, they both have their nuances. And you're like, God, why are we doing this? What is this is different. But 
Yeah. You guys are more like the Air Force. So everything you do is pretty much Air Force boy, right? Yeah, they actually have us down as one of the five pillars in the Air Force. So, yeah. um, you know, we, we, there are certain missions that we'll get called on. And I, I do kind of get, it's not stolen valor per se, but like, I get annoyed when people walk around, you know, and so if you're a cadet, please don't do this around me. It annoys me. But um, like they go, right, I'm, in the, I'm in the Air Force auxiliary. Okay, that's yeah. kind of true, kind of not, but like, you know, you, like the pilots, like we are when we're on a mission from the Air Force, you know? Um, so if there's yeah. a search and rescue going on or like with you, with you guys, with the F-16s, you know, we'll do a couple things. We'll do um, slow flights to look for power lines or antennas, mm -hmm. you know, kind of clear the area to make sure you guys are safe. Um, you don't have obstructions for you guys. As well as, you know, we try to play, you know, um, you know, bad people that are hiding, you know? I'll try mm -hmm. to play Mr. and Mrs. Drug Dealer, you know, or, yeah. you know, I'm going to go attack the White House, you know, or something like that. And you have to come find me and try to escort me out of a place, um, which is always fun because I, you know, my stall speed's like 50 miles an hour. So, um, you know, so I can just slow it down real fast. But um, so, you know, so when we're doing that stuff, we're Air Force Auxiliary. But otherwise, you know, we are a volunteer organization called Civil Air Patrol, just for people that are listening. Right. So. But your, your, your reg what I was talking about was more your rules and regulations are based all Air off Force. of the Air Force way yeah. out versus the Navy. You know, the, the running joke is the Air Force tells you what you can do and spells it right out in, in, in AFI. And the yep. Navy tells you what you can't do and everything else is kind of... Eh, <laughs> it's a gray or, zone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, now, so since you've had experience with both, now let's, let's say you've got a time machine. So th this doesn't yeah. have to be a current generation aircraft. Doesn't have to, you know, doesn't have to be something in the past if, if you don't want it to be. But just if you wanted to fly the most coolest airplane you ever could in your life, and it didn't have to be military, it could be GA if you wanted what what would be that airplane like? Like if you, oh, Tom, man, what would it Tom be? Tomcats, Tomcats, yeah, it's gotta be Tomcats, yeah. man. It's got to. Yeah, I would choose to be a, a early '80s, maybe maybe a right after Top Gun Tomcat pilot. Like yeah. that's it, just fighter how, pilot flying Tomcats. How old were you when Top when uh, Top Gun came out? Three. I ah, see so you were pretty young. All right. Yeah. So I yeah, I watched it till I was like ten. 11. <laughs> so some, some kids watch GI Joe and you just have Top Gun on, on repeat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. I, I, no, I was all about GI Joe and GI Joe had a Tomcat. Well, it was oh, that's true a too. weird looking Tomcat, but it Did was Did you have Tomcat. that when you were a kid? Oh, yeah. Did you have the toy? Like the really no, big I, F-14 I had, Tomcat GI Joe? I didn't. No, uh, I always had the tanks. Oh, that's still pretty cool too. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so, okay. So the Tomcat. Now, have you ever had a chance to fly in a Tomcat or they were all... No, they were, they were gone by the time I was in... I think they... 2006 is when they retired them and I didn't even, I commissioned in 06 and then um, started flying and in, in, in later in 2006 and got my wings in 2007. Yep. Now, when you started flying, <laughs> and, you know, it, you, I'm certain because you were a young guy when you, when you got into the Navy and I'm sure there was like the 20, 30 year old veterans, you know, pilots, right. That have been flying forever. So some of them, I'm sure when you came in were F-14 pilots. Right. Oh yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I, it, there were guys uh, not not when I came in because on the on the Air Force side, there's I mean, right. well, I take that back. We did have a Tomcat guy in my uh, Air Force Reserve Squadron that actually had just transferred in. Um, he was awesome, dude. He didn't really talk about it that much. Oh, that's right. um, but when I got to 204, there were three Tomcat guys, and that's mm -hmm. where. People always ask me where I got the Tomcats. You know, we're just randomly yelling out Tomcats. And it's because when we would do dining outs, the Tomcat guys would start yelling that just as because they were proud of it. You know, they yeah. were proud of it versus the Hornet, you know, but uh, they all flew. I think they were all D model uh, mm -hmm. Hornet or uh, Tomcat okay. guys. So they flew the, the newer ones. Um, but yeah, awesome. Just an awesome jet. Yeah. See, now for me, you, you fly my favorite. My favorite is the F 16. So. They, yeah. um, although, although I did, um, Pensacola Naval air station. Um, mm -hmm. I went down there for a little bit. We were doing some training down there and, um, they, they, the guys had some fun. They have simulators down there for the F 18s. And so the guys were like, Oh, you know, what? let's, let's do some dog fighting. I'm like dog fighting. I fly <laughs> a Cessna. I don't know how to dog fight. What are you talking about? So he was like, Oh, come on. We'll just do it for fun. You know? So they had the thing open. So back to the iron Eagle thing, you know, the, the simulators open. So, but, but I remember what was so funny was being six foot eight this thing is not designed for me. <laughs> and so, and so the canopy is coming down and it's like, I'm looking at this canopy. It's coming down, 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 <laughs> down. And I'm like, 
I'm crunched up like a turtle and I can't even move the stick, let alone anything else. And they're like, yeah, let's dogfight. I'm like, I can't breathe. <laughs> um, but anyways, that was pretty fun. Um, I, I would, I would love to be like six foot two, I think, and fly an F-16. It just seems like that'd be an awesome airplane. I, I'm, I'm jealous. I'm jealous of the F-16. Well, if you're going to fly the Viper, you probably want to be like 5'10", 5'9". Yeah, 6'2 is too big. big guy. Yeah. yeah, you want to, you want to have some, some room to roam. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's cramped. I mean, I had, I always ran the seat all the way down. Is it comfortable? Yeah. Is it comfortable to fly? I mean, or is it yeah. like, because it's got yeah. that laid back yeah. seat, doesn't it? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's not completely laid back. I mean, you're kind of sitting forward just at a, a, rec a recline there. Um, but no, it, it, it was, the only time it was ever uncomfortable was we would do, uh, in combat, we had survival gear. Mm -hmm. And I was there in 2009, and I'd seen all the beheading videos of yeah. what happens if you eject over uh, bad guy land. Yeah. So I was the guy carrying the M9, which is a 9mm Beretta, and like six magazines, which I oh. thought made me pretty <laughs> badass. What it actually did was weight. give me back problems because it made me top heavy. Yeah. So because you're sitting at, at an angle, you're kind of leaning forward. So you're, you're top heavy here. So that whole time you're sitting there six hours in an airplane and you're doing this. Mm -hmm. And you know, after a while your back starts to, starts to hurt. So that was the only time it was ever really uncomfortable, but usually, you know, for the, I flew, uh, my longest flight was like seven and a half hours from, uh, Honolulu to Dallas mm -hmm. and it was fine. All right, so people are going to... I don't know if I'd do it now, but I, it was fine back then when I was in my 20s. <laughs> All right. So one of the questions I always get from our kids that are, um, uh, you know, looking at long-haul pilots flying in F-22s and F-16s and things like that, how did you go to the bathroom? Pedal packs. That's right. So <laughs> do I have any? I don't know. I usually have. I I, <laughs> I actually did a... Uh, I, I might still have it somewhere. But uh, no, it, it, so it's basically this little plastic bag and it's got these little crystals um, that you know you loosen your straps. <laughs> yeah. You don't. You don't. If you, well, you can't. Sometimes you completely unstrap. It depends on the aircraft. You got to be careful with the F-16 because guys have completely unstrapped, and then the 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 lap belt has hit the stick. Oh. And there have been dudes that have gotten that wrapped around Rolled the stick it over. and just ended up uh, ejecting because it's, they wow. lost control of the aircraft. Yeah. Um, that's an but, embarrassing, that's an embarrassing story to tell your CEO why yeah, you had to be checked out of the airplane. It, dear boss, no <laughs> one was more surprised as, than I. Um, but so it's really, I mean, honestly, it, you, you get used to it. It becomes something that's very easy to do. Um, you know, it's, it's no big deal. It's a non-event. You roll it up. It, it, so it basically takes the, the urine and crystallizes it and makes it a gel and you just roll the bag up, you know, it doesn't yep. leak or anything, it's sealed, and then you put it in your helmet bag, and... There you go. The more, the more complicated one is the other variant of going to the bathroom, which my, I've heard of guys doing it. <laughs> that you just got to hold on to. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's not, it's not, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> yeah, that one you hold on to. So th thankfully, yeah. thankfully, the, the range of the Cessna, I think, is like five and a half hours, so I haven't had that issue yet, so... Um, but, uh, all right, so post-military, um, actually, I want to go to the commercial a, a little in a second, but actually, I want to come to something else you've recently started doing, and that is flying helicopters. So sure. why on earth would you want to fly a helicopter? Like, are you just look, looking for something that has less glide ratio than an F-18? Like, like what's... Well, well <laughs> for, first of all, it's, it's on hold right now. There was some drama with my... Um, instructor who's actually he, he might actually be watching it. how is he doing is he doing all right because i actually have watched a, those videos he's so. a civil air patrol pilot himself oh is he so, okay oh he is uh he's doing better but he had a mishap yep. and uh that put a stop to my training and then the helicopter there were some issues with who who was scheduling and who was flying and i wasn't comfortable with some of the maintenance sure. practices and stuff and now they're selling the helicopter it's gone <laughs> so what i decided to do was use the gi bill and mm -hmm. skip uh private and go straight to commercial now i'm just waiting on getting that scheduled uh with my airline job and stuff because i've got to dedicate a couple uh, three weeks to go to um houston to go get it done uh, as for why, uh, funny story on the vlog of all things. So the YouTube channel has been um, 
a great opportunity. And it goes back to the networking because I've had so many people like yourself email me and say, hey, you know, why don't you come do this? Why don't we talk about this or whatever? And when this the channel was brand new, um, the Harrison County Sheriff's Office uh, contacted me and they said, hey, why don't you come out and check out our, our helicopter? We're right down the street from you. And I'm mm-hmm. like, hmm, I like Airwolf. Let's try this out. <laughs> and the whole drive around, there, you're doing the song in your head. Da, 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 yeah, da. It, it, we flew around and it was, um, it, it, we just flew around the beach. And I did an interview with him and he talked about it and stuff. And I was like, man, that was, that was pretty cool. You know, that was fun flying with the doors off. You know, you can mm-hmm. do, go wherever you want and everything. So then he invited me back out. And uh, this time they're like, you want to hover? And I'm like, okay, let me try this. And it's, it's the most, it takes so much coordination. It reminded me of flying like, fingertip in hard imc bad weather where we're maneuvering a lot i mean it's just there's so many fine corrections and stuff and you're like god this is a challenge and you know to your younger reader readers watchers (laughs) viewers listeners uh you want to keep yourself challenged you know it's it's always a good idea to do something new and, and do that so i got the wild idea that i'm like wow this covid thing sucks you know i, mm-hmm. I need something to do Oh, I'll just do it and, and blog it and, and, you know, we'll see how, how it works out. And the idea possibly with maybe going back and flying with a sheriff's office unit, cause I do law enforcement. I'm a sheriff's deputy here, mm-hmm. um, locally. So I was like, well, maybe I can fly law enforcement. Maybe it's just something else I'll do. And so, um, I, I called the number my, um, uh, on the, uh, FAA uh, medical, you know, mm-hmm. the examiner, he had a little ad for it. And I'm like, let's do this. So I, I called the number. I'm like, Hey, I'd like to go get flying lessons. And they're like, all right, come out and, and do it. And it was where we where it failed because it, it, it could have worked out is we had airspeed indicator issues, which, uh, for the kids at home, a tomato flames, it's not a suggestion. It's kind of required. <laughs> um, so we, we chase those demons and, what I recommend for anybody that's going through, whether it's your private pilot's license, your instrument, your commercial, or whatever, set aside the money, set aside the time, and knock it out. Yep. Because if you don't, what will happen is exactly what happened to me, where I did that, you know, I, I did, and with every intent of finishing it, you know, in, in two months, which I was on track to do. But what happened was when we started chasing the airspeed indicator things, we started pushing off the timeline. Mm-hmm. And the more I pushed off the timeline, then I ran into, well, I've got to go back and do my military job now. So that's going to break off a week. And so it pushed it enough to while I was waiting for them to fix the helicopter that by the time I came back, the window was shrinking and then the examiner wasn't available. Yeah. So they were like, OK, well, we'll s- stretch out the remaining hours to, to make it to where you're just finishing so you can go fly with the examiner. And then that's when he had his mishap and it all fell apart. And at that point. I didn't have, you know, gobs and gobs of time because COVID had prevented me from going to the military squadron as well uh, in my c- civilian job. So the window just closed. And mm. so then I found myself in a situation where, you know, there was no more helicopter. There was no, you know, I had to go somewhere else to do it. So if I had been able to knock it out in two months, I'd have been done. You know, I'd had my private pilot's license. By the time he would have had his mishap, it wouldn't have, been ma- wouldn't have mattered anymore. But because that little bit of delay and that little bit of fighting and, you know, I, I talk about it in the video, mm-hmm. you're never obligated to take an aircraft flying. Right. So part of that, too, was, you know, you kind of get lulled into, well, you know, we tried to fix it. And then you go up and they're like, it's not fixed. And you're like, OK, well, do we keep going or do I land right now and we're done? And it's like, well, we can go do hover practice or we can go do stuff you know, that doesn't necessarily require it. Cause remember it's a helicopter. Mm-hmm. So it's not like we're always doing patterns and stuff like that. We can go do other stuff. But if, if I'd have said, Nope, you know what? I'm done. You need to fix this. Right. Then it may have gotten fixed earlier because another student showed up and they were like, well, he's only doing hovering. So we don't really need to fix it yet. Mm-hmm. And so that just drags it out, drags it out, drags it out. So my biggest lesson learned was, you know, I shouldn't have accepted it, you know, after, you know, fool me once, you know, shame on you. But the second time, shame on me. 
Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what happened is, you know, we flew it once. It wasn't working. It was kind of sketchy. I'm like, hey, man, you're going to check that out. OK, sure. When they finally fixed it, it was like the fourth time, you mm-hmm. know, and legally it was fine. You know, I we were he was they were trying to fix it. But I just I you know, it was one of those things where it, it should have been like, look, prove it. Let's make sure that this is this is fixed and let's get it done now. So. Now, you still think you're going to, are you going to, you still want to finish that? I mean, you seem like a guy oh, that once yeah. you get a, a yeah, mission, no, I, you're not I, stopping. I, so that's what, I was, that's what I was saying. I'm, I'm, so at this point, because I'm already, I've already got my ATP. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, you don't need an ATP, you need a commercial. But because I'm already fixed wing qualified, I don't actually need a private. I can, because mm-hmm. the commercial check ride is the exact same as the private, just tighter standards. Mm-hmm. So my plan is to use the GI Bill, which, you know, having served, I have. Uh, and go to a, a, a no kidding school and then finish it. You know, it's, it's 35 hours, but at least I'll walk away with a commercial. Cool. The issue is just getting it scheduled. I mean, yeah. cause instead of driving an hour to the airport, like I could do now I've got to go get a hotel, stay somewhere, you know, be gone. And that's just finding the time commitments. You know, so it's like ATP, but ATP for helicopters. So there is an eight. Well, I mean, there is an ATP for helicopters. Is there really? Is I didn't your, know that. Yeah. Yeah. There's ATP H. Oh. So, uh, but this is just your commercial. It's okay. it's commercial. It's the exact same, you know, um, as as fixed wing commercial, mm-hmm. you know, flying for hire essentially. Now, now, so th- that's pretty cool. And you know what? To be honest with you, I can totally picture you, totally picture you as a heli- like a sheriff helicopter pilot, like yeah, it's, it's and like and fun. like like a Grand Theft Auto style. <laughs> helicopter pilot popping off rounds from the helicopter just, yeah just flying sideways chasing like i just like that's you i can see it you can i mean <laughs> even though you're not flying fighter speeds i mean mm-hmm. speed is relative you know we went down yeah, you're low to the ground really low faster. areas and you're you know you're flying you know 60 knots 69 knots but you know you're 20 feet off the ground mm-hmm. you know it's and to me the challenge of flying a good approach with a helicopter. I mean, it's just, cause it's just so different, you know, it's so different. It's so much more coordination, you know, it's, it's stick and rudder. Um, you know, you use right pedal, you use left pedal, you know, it's different with the pulling the collective and stuff like that. Auto rotations are scary, but fun, especially <laughs> the, the Robinson. You know, it's a low inertia rotor. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't, it doesn't have a lot of glide to it versus, you know, I've flown the OH 58 and, you know, you go do an auto rotation in it and it just, it, glides like an airplane you know, yeah. it's a very smooth and safe aircraft i didn't know they could glide that well so yeah. i've always thought with a helicopter if your engine quit you kind of look down and you go okay i'm gonna land somewhere there <laughs> so. yeah no it it's got i mean i mean it's not it's obviously not like an aircraft but you know it's got enough you can have enough energy like hueys and stuff can basically get in the ground effect and actually take back off and turn around like they don't have they're not stuck in in one place it's it's very fascinating the physics behind helicopter flying. Sweet, sweet. So I, I look forward to those. I do. Um, I we'll get to the YouTube channel in just a second. Um, as is written closer to wrapping up. But um, I wanted to talk real quick about your books. So so in addition to everything else that you do, you're also an author. So tell us about your uh, your book series. Uh, well, there's two of them. Uh, well, there's 10 books total. Uh, oh, wow. Eight of them are, are the Spectre series, um, which I started writing that. Uh, I, I wrote the first couple chapters uh, when I came back from a deployment. And I was like, well, you know, what if? And I shelved it because the I, I, didn't, I didn't have time for it. And then I came back when I was transferring from the Air Force Reserve. The one thing you'll notice in the military is you, you end up with a lot of time. Because when you transfer, there's there's this time where you're not getting paid. You're not uh, they they don't have your paperwork done. They don't have the transfer done or or whatever. So I had a lot of time where I was just sitting and doing nothing. So I was like, well, I'll pick up that book and and start writing. And by then it was, you know, four years later from when I had first started writing it or three years later and just had ideas. I'm like, well, what if. I didn't think I was interesting enough to write like an autobiography or anything like that. I didn't want to write about myself, but what I wanted to do was take my experience as an F-16 pilot and try to make something plausible, realistic, but still fun in the same sense of like Vince Flynn or Brad Thor, because, you know, I loved reading those kind of books. I wanted something that was like an action hero, but we throw in some aviation and it works, you know, and it's realistic and stuff. But, the, the problem with 
that is I it I had to do it in Homestead just for the the plot and stuff. And unfortunately, when you do stuff stuff like that, sometimes people mistake fiction for reality. And so some people thought, oh yeah, this is about you know me and this, and it's like no, dude, I, it, it it's just because in that sense I wasn't creative enough to come up with something better for the plot that I needed to do. So in hindsight, having it based there, I mean, having been at Homestead was kind of, eh, you know, because it, it, you know, some people may have thought, you know, this is about what I was doing, but other than me just trying to go, well, what if? There was nothing, no relation to what I actually did at Homestead versus, you know, what was in the book. So if, if you're listening to the podcast, um, inside the show notes for the podcast, I will have the links for the books in there. And then if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll have a bunch of stuff. So I'm gonna have the links for the books. I'll also have um, a link to Mover's uh, YouTube site. Um, and if you wanna follow him on Twitter, I'll put his uh, his Twitter handle in there as well. Um, I just got on Twitter. I, I swear to God to you, I, I, I had two people yesterday. I got a third person today and you would have thought I won the lottery. I was like, holy cow, I have a third person on Twitter that's following me. So, um, but, uh, you know, for, for my three followers, <laughs> if they're interested, um, they can go out and they can follow you too. Um, no, so the question I had was, I, I, I'm interested for some reason, for, um, for people that are writing books, it seems like more and more people that feel like they, you know, they can't write a book because they need to have a big publisher. And the whole self-publishing thing, a lot of people that I'm talking to in aviation you know, because there's not a, you know, you're not Stephen King, you know, you're not going to get the 4 million people probably, unless you're really awesome, you know, probably not going to, unless you're Tom Clancy or something. Right. Um, so people, they, they come at it from a smaller perspective and they build up their community over time. Um, yeah. and like most things in life. And so the self-publishing thing has really been helpful for them. So did you self-publish or did you, uh, did you actually yeah. work with a publisher? No, no, all, uh, all 10 books are self-published and, um, you are a small business owner when you do it that way. I mean, you're responsible for uh, making sure that you have an editor, which I recommend getting an editor. Um, you know, you're going to have to spend the money to do it, you know, to pay somebody to edit your books. Um, you're going to have to get somebody to make your cover unless you're, you know, gifted with graphics or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, the publishing part is free. I mean, to, to put it on Amazon or draft to digital, which does, uh, which is what I use, um, Barnes and Noble, Kobo, it, it does all the other ones other than Amazon. Um, and then to actually put it in print, because my books are available in print, you know, you can do Ingram Spark, or you can do Amazon or, or whatever. What it does, though, is it puts everything on you. So you are marketing, which even though the, the, the big misconception, which you kind of alluded to, people think, well, I got a book deal. I'm going to be rich. Right. And most published books never even sell enough books to meet their advance. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, I mean, it, it, even the ones that are successful, rarely do publishers really put a whole lot of marketing in there. You know, they don't, they don't really back up uh, authors unless it's a big name. You're not, you know, putting them on shows and stuff. In fact, I've got a friend that just traditionally published his first book and, you know, he is, if it weren't for the fact that he already had connections and ability to get on major TV shows, they, they he would have no marketing for it. I mean, they're just, right. they're other, you know, they're just putting it in the stores for him. So, uh, and I think in general, the model is going more towards eBooks and, and stuff like that. I mean, especially with now stores are closed. You can't go walk, you know, you can't go walk and pick up a book and, and look mm -hmm. at it anymore. So I think that the, the gap is narrowing, but the biggest thing is to make sure you've got a quality product and that you have the ability to, to market it, which that's the hardest part. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, there are some self-published authors making, you know, $100,000, $200,000 a year because they're just plugging out books and plugging out books and they don't care what the quality is, but, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're, they're doing that. Um, but what I will say, my advice, everybody asks me about, you know, writing a book and, and kind of what the advice is. And my biggest advice is it's, it's almost the same vein as the make them tell you no thing. Finish the book first before you edit it. You have a, a lot of people will shelve their work before it ever gets published, because what they'll do is they'll write a little bit. Then they're like, ah, I don't like that. And then I'll edit it and erase it or whatever. Then they'll write a little bit and then they'll edit it and they'll never finish. 
right. because it'll never be good enough and they're always trying to polish it. So what I, what I do, um, which lately it's been harder. I mean, I'm working on book 11 right now and it's the longest it's ever taken me to write a book because I've got so much else going on. I mean, mm -hmm. but on the same token, everything else that's going on is helping promote the other books. So, you know, it's, it's kind of feeding itself, but the, the way I do it is I write the book and then I let it sit and then I go back and I start editing. I give it to somebody else. I let them look at it, then get their notes. I edit and then I send it off to the editor. And what that does is it keeps me from doing what I did the first time I tried to write a book, which is write five chapters, read it and go, yeah, I don't really like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you shelve it because you don't have the time or interest or whatever to finish it. So the people that finish usually are the ones that just write and then you know, edit later. That's cool. I, I really, I really dig the whole self publishing thing. Um, yeah. yeah, it really opens it up for people, you know, cause otherwise, you know, if you're not in the, in the publishing game, you know, it still gives you uh, an opportunity to get in there. So, um, I I've think had that's so awesome. many rejection letters cause I tried, I mean, I, I did the query process with agents and stuff and I've got so many rejection letters. Uh, and now I've sold more books than they ever could have done for me. So, mm -hmm. You know, I recently yeah. talked to um, Alex Stone. I don't know if you know who that is. He 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 wrote a book, self published too, uh, called um, uh, oh shoot, he's got one book called uh, CFI, um, where he talks about all the horror stories from being a CFI. Um, pretty funny. And then um, uh, what was the other one? It was um, it was basically a, a ferry pilot, uh, but he was flying oh, wow. flying checks. Um, yeah. So, but uh, but yeah, he did the same thing. And what he said was interesting, you know, for him and maybe for you as well. Is you know when he started. And this also goes to YouTube thing and we'll finish up with the YouTube, but, um, you know, he started and there wasn't, there was a little bit of movement, but not a ton, mm. but then all of a sudden, like three years later, some algorithm or something somehow like <laughs> <laughs> caught on to it. And like, yeah. you know, he like tripled his book sales, like, <laughs> you know, in like a couple of weeks, um, you know, which is, which is funny how all that works, but, um, yeah. but that's great though. The self-publishing. Um, all right. So last thing I had for you. So, um, now, a lot of people, and this is how I, I, I know of you. Um, I never bumped into you, you know, when you were coming out of your F-16, um, is I ran into <laughs> you on YouTube. So, yep. you know, you get out there, you know, it's two in the morning. And you're like, okay, you know, what, 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 what videos can I go down a rabbit hole? And one of the rabbit holes led me to you. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, and, and so right now, as of last I checked, I don't know if, how, what you watch your stats, but um, I just took a look before uh, we came on. And you're just about a quarter of a million subscribers, which is pretty awesome. Um, and I know, I'm sorry, you have, um, no, that's right. Yeah. A quarter million subscribers and then 1.76 million views. Um, so I think that that's right. I think I wrote that down. Right. Um, so I, Hey guys, editor Bob here. Hey, um, I wanted to give you a quick update to, uh, that 1.76 million. I got that wrong. He's had 45.9 million uh, views lifetime, a ton of views. Uh, the 1.76 million views, that's how many views he's had just in the last 30 days. Um, pretty impressive. Anyways, wanted to give a quick correction on that. Thanks so much, bye. That's just amazing to me to even think, like 1.76 million views. So, you know, and obviously a lot of those people are the same people, but even if you take, you know, roughly, oh, you'll know, you'll know your own numbers, but you know, about a third of the people watching your videos tend to be subscribers, give or take, um, uh, what I found. So if, if you've got a quarter million, you know, subscribers, that means probably close to three quarter to a million people, um, have watched your videos, different people have watched your videos. Um, and so the fact, and it's really cool is because, you know, you have that military experience, but you have it from not just one part, right? You know, you've, and, and to be honest with you, for anybody listening, I recommend you check out his videos because he's honest. Like, you know, you, you say what you want to say and that's refreshing. You know, you don't have, yeah. you know, Boeing isn't paying you a hundred thousand dollars a year to sell their products, you know, and uh, I'm not throwing shade at anybody, but in Boeing, if you want to give me a hundred thousand dollars, I'll sell your product. But, <laughs> hey, well, I mean, well, I mean, I'll say it. But. Me and my 670 subscribers. Um, so, um, but you know, we, but you, you're, you're honest and what's great is you're really, but you have that technical background. You're not faking it. Um, you know, you have that background. And so anybody that's really interested, you know, in military aviation, um, you know, you're, and you're not just interested in somebody talking about something from world war two, which is very fascinating too, but you're looking at something that's more recent. 
um, you know, I really, really recommend you to go check out Movers uh, YouTube channel. Um, now I do have to ask you people listening, this is horrible podcasting. So, so <laughs> cause I'm gonna ask you a question that nobody is going to freaking know anything about what I'm talking about. So you went to go buy a truck <laughs> and then That's I'm gonna true. let you go. Cause now I'm way, now I'm way past the aviation, but you went to go buy a truck cause mover does things more than just aviation. Right. So, uh, he, he has cars on there. He has videos when he does his sheriff work. Um, so, so you went to go buy your truck. They, they played games with you, you know, with the tires mm-hmm. and everything. And, and I, I have to tell you, I'm not, I'm, I'm being completely honest. After that video, I went to Amazon and I bought a tire pressure gauge, um, tire, <laughs> a, tread, a tread gauge. And I went around and checked all my the vehicles. Tire, tire. <laughs> the tread depth measuring gauge. That's right. It was like $10 or something like that. Yeah. And I was going to write Amazon and tell them, hey, listen, you should really give Mover an affiliate code because <laughs> there's, there's a good number of people that, you know, somebody in Amazon is like, why are, why are so many people buying tread <laughs> gauges yeah. tonight? Oh, but did oh, you end up getting a, a truck? No, but you know what? I'll tell you for your listeners only. I'll tell you what I'm thinking about ordering. All uh, right, maybe look at tomorrow. this. Uh, so here's your exclusive. I'm thinking about getting a Durango Hellcat. Oh, you're kidding me! Oh, that is nice. All right, all right. So for all the listeners out there, when you listen to this, awesome. don't tell anybody else. This is our yeah. secret. <laughs> yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, I look forward to seeing that. Um, listen, I think the only other thing I had on here. Um, just real quick, so um, DCS. So I think it's called DCS, right? That's the aviation yeah, military combat simulator world or whatever. Yeah, you think, seem yeah. to be really into that. So the one question I kind of had for that was, uh, and that's is that what Folds of Honor is? Is what's Folds of Honor from? That's Folds actually Folds of Honor. Uh, so uh, Dan Rooney, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dan Rooney, now is a pilot in my current squadron. And um, I learned about Folds of Honor. It's a they do. It's a nonprofit that does educational scholarships for uh, families of the fallen or injured in combat. Okay. So he's got an amazing story. Check him out. Foh.org or foldsofhonor.org. Um, he, I mean, just an amazing human being. I mean, he's sent so many kids to college and stuff. And so it's a cause that you know, I picked up. I, I I believe in it. I believe in him. You know, I know it's one of those because a lot of charities you don't know who's running it, and I know. Dan Rooney, I know Noonan and, you know, I, I'd go to war with him. You know, I, I, I believe in what he's doing. I think he's a great human being. So that's, that's that DCS. I mean, eh. so I got in, I got into DCS because, uh, hurricane Michael rolled through and every video I was doing in 2018, somebody was commenting that I needed to play DCS and I didn't know what it was. So, mm-hmm. uh, in fact, one of the viewers was like, Hey, you can come do a video. You can play at my house. So, I made a deal with the viewers at the time, and I said, look, if we get uh, this much money for the GoFundMe um, to help the victims of Hurricane Michael, then I'll go play the game. You know, I'll go, I'll go do it. And so I did that, and um, that increased the subscriber base. Mm-hmm. Uh, that video now has got, I think, 4 million views. Wow. Um, but so... I did that video and everybody was mad at me because I didn't take it seriously or whatever. Um, and then I did another video with Gonky. I forgot what we, we said we would do, but you know, if we reached a certain milestone, Gonky and I would fight. Mm-hmm. And so we did. And um, that video has got 2 million views. Wow. And so, um, you know, I, 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 the community kind of embraced me. So I started, um, I, I did a couple videos here and there, and we started this tournament called Fight for Honor 2020, which I thought would be a good fundraising opportunity for Folds of Honor, you know, to take fighter uh, aviation. Okay. That's how I got them mixed up then. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So we started the, the tournament. So then to, to, for the first time we did the tournament, to build up to the tournament, I started doing more. I got DCS on my own laptop at the time, mm-hmm. and I started, you know, doing DCS videos and stuff. And what I thought at, at first was, you know, I'll do it as kind of an educational you know, to show kids kind of what we do and, and stuff like that. And then, um, eventually I got a real computer for like video editing and stuff (laughs) that could run DCS Mm -hmm. and it became more of, and I still aggravate people. Um, the most DCS videos I ever did, we did a a promo with Eagle dynamics, which was awesome where they uh, gave me a coupon code and 10% of all the proceeds they were going to donate to folds of honor. Well, we almost raised $10,000. Wow. That's Um, awesome. I mean, that was the donation. It was like a hundred thousand or, or mm. whatever in sales. 
but 10,000 went to Folds of Honor. And I was like, God, this is awesome. So w I've done a bunch of DCS videos and, you know, people ask, do you play? Well, not unless I'm doing a video for the channel or for Twitch or whatever, but I do enjoy it. Um, you know, I think it does open the door to other people to kind of see uh, different things. I don't take it all that seriously when I do it, you know, I like to have fun and that aggravates people. There's some really cool <laughs> stuff. I mean, there, I mean, there are times I, I tell you what I genuinely enjoy about it is when I get to go and play um, with friends that, and just goof off and I fly in something that I've never flown before, mm -hmm. um, you know, in a, a Tomcat or a Huey or, or whatever, that's the stuff I enjoy. And I think it actually kind of helped me, for the helicopter training. Cause mm -hmm. I practiced a little bit on DCS and then I went and did it and I'm like, yeah, you know, it's not the muscle memory is there. So it has its utility, um, for, I, I do, because I'm still an active fighter pilot and because it is a very international audience, I shy away from doing right. a lot of stuff in the Hornet and the, and the F-16. Cause they might um, see, cause somebody could see strategy and I'll say something stupid, you know, I mean, yeah. people don't understand, uh, tactics are classified and people yeah. always they're like well you need to go dogfight this guy you need to go dogfight this guy and it's like dude a lot of that stuff what I've always been afraid of is and and I this is why I intentionally avoid it is I don't want to do something because I've seen this you know I've seen where people because they analyze it with a microscope they're like wait a minute you were at this airspeed and you mm -hmm. were doing this at this time why did you do that you know and it could be because I just, you know, I'm in a video game. <laughs> He's messing this, around. Yeah. This, is not, this is nothing like the real, real life. Or it could be because you revert back to something that you remember. And now I just accidentally, you know, did something I wasn't supposed to. So mm -hmm. I kind of shy away from those. I'll do. I mean, I have done some Hornet stuff. I have done some F-16 stuff, but it's very, very benign. You know, it's nothing that, you know, can can do that. But I do enjoy doing all the other stuff. And, you know, it's. It's a it's a fun game. Uh, the guys, uh, Matt Wagner, uh, Wags, who's the developer, uh, he's down in Tucson. He's a great guy. Um, you know, they've, they've been very good for the cause and, and raising money for Folds of Honor and stuff. And, you know, we, we've done a great job with the tournament. So um, definitely a, a good relationship to have. Well, that's awesome that the communities nowadays, you know, they can get together and they can do positive impact, you know, while they're having fun. Uh, but yeah. they can get together and they can... You couldn't do really, I don't know, maybe you could, but I don't know how you really do that 30 years ago, 40 years ago. I mean, you, you know, not like this. I mean, you know. No, and, and we've made it, I mean, so last year or this year, rather, we made it more like a, we tried to make it more like a, a, a fight, mm -hmm. you know, like a UFC tournament. I got a bunch of fighter pilots uh, that flown Hornets with me and we did a Discord thing and we live streamed it and we did commentary with, uh, um, DCS World Events, who Moltar is the guy who was call sign, he does these live stream events and he's a good broadcaster. So we had him doing the play by play and then we had us doing, you know, the John Madden, you know, well, in order to, to kill the mm -hmm. other guy, you've got to gun him. You know, I mean, it's <laughs> stuff like that. You got to get the bullets on his airplane. You got to score more points than the other person yeah. to win the game. Oh, thank yeah. you for that. I appreciate yeah. that yeah. insightful so, commentary. So, I mean, there's been some really cool opportunities you know, in doing that. So it, it, it's, it's been fun. It's been fun. The, the, the biggest downside with DCS is sometimes the community can, I mean, they could be rough. They get a little toxic. Know? They, they can be rough, but overall it's been a, it's been a fun experience. Sweet. Well, I can't play those games. I'll be shot down in about 13 seconds by some like eight, eight year old, uh, like, you know, so sleep, like half asleep in his bed. I so. mean, by far me too i mean it's a different it's a different world it's just a different skill set mm -hmm. you know the 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 motor skills required to be good at dcs are a little different than the motor than what you need to be in a jet because you don't have any of the forces you don't feel right. the jet you know you yeah. might even have vr but you know you're looking over your shoulder you know i can feel the rumble of the jet mm -hmm. i can feel the jet talks to me when i fight and I know kind of basic energy states based on all that stuff, but you're desensitized when you're in VR. So you, you mean just, there's no, there's no force feedback or anything. So you can just pull and, you know, next thing you know, you're like, why am I at 45 knots? Yeah. And you need and, a couple of 300 pound kids in the neighborhood to all jump on you when you're making a turn, yeah. try to feel what those yeah. G forces are going to feel like. So, well, 
on the flip side, I mean, they don't know that either. I mean, right. they, you know, they they get the oh well, I'm just sitting at one G in my living room, and it's I mean, this is <laughs> normal. It's good, like, yeah. Oh, dude, no, <laughs> no, you would not be pulling nine Gs for that long, man. <laughs> yeah, you'd, you'd, you'd be, be out. out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, last. I got one last question for you. So, so now you, you've moved into commercial aviation, but like COVID has hit, right? So, and I'm not sure. Um, I haven't seen any you talk many videos about this. Uh, I might just missed them. But um, are, are you are you that your long term goal? Do you want to get back into commercial? Because um, you said you were a 737 pilot, right? Yeah. So uh, I'm both. I, I mean, I'm I'm an airline pilot. Um, I and I'm flying for the reserve. So I, mm -hmm. I still do military and I still do uh, commercial flying. Uh, this year, uh, I've taken a, a leave of absence from the airline. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they offered them up voluntary leaves of absence, and I took one. Um, you know, I, long, long term, yeah. Short term, it's it's more mill oriented. You know, I, I, I want to continue doing what I'm doing. Uh, long, long term, I would honestly rather write books for a living than oh, be an airline that. pilot, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but. You that's, can't, you can't, you can't just get another pilot with you on the 737 and go to long haul and like put an autopilot and write all your books in there and just like, you know, well, forget the checklist and everything. My, my last flight in the 737, when I go back, I'm supposed to go to the Airbus. Oh, okay. so I, I will never, yeah, the 737's done, but, um, I will say, so you bring up the airline thing. I've done a video on the airlines and stuff, but the biggest thing I will say, cause I'm sure there's kids, you know, mm -hmm. that are cadets and stuff that may be thinking about it. Have a backup plan. Yep. Have a backup plan. Don't just don't have commercial aviation as your one trick pony because mm -hmm. there are sixteen hundred or seventeen hundred pilots at my airline that have been furloughed wow. and that are now on the street. And a lot of them are doing well because they've got mill to back them up. Mm -hmm. They can do military reserve. They've got their own side businesses. They've got something else. But the people that put go all in aviation so what i tell people when they're like what kind of degree should i get and they're like i want to go be a you know aviation degree aviation degree is fine right however it's probably better if you have a passion like if you like accounting mm -hmm. go go get an accounting degree because that way and keep up with it because that way because the airlines are always cyclical they're never you know it's never going to be uh 100 good all the time so, you know, when the next downturn happens, you can just roll right into your real estate job or your mm -hmm. accounting job or whatever you have, and then use the airline as more of a, a lifestyle, you right. know, and, and, and I think that that's the key to success because I know a lot of airline pilots that have businesses and, and the ones that have businesses, when the downturn happens, they're not as worried as the ones that this is all I have and now I'm in debt and I've mm -hmm. got, you know, my wife doesn't work. And, you know, it's uh, there are all these stressors that are building up and yeah. your job just went bye bye. Yeah. Yeah. They graduated like, from the aviation school. It cost them a hundred thousand dollars and then, you know, yeah. got those loans. And all of a sudden it was bad enough when they could get the regional job, um, you know, yeah. making minimum wage, you know, for a couple of years. Uh, but now they can't even get that. So, yeah. But at the, at the end of the day, corporate America does not care about you. Right. I mean, learn this now. <laughs> the airline does not, you are a production unit. You, know, mm -hmm. you are an employee number to them and nothing more. So don't think that, oh, well, you know, next downturn, they're going to take care of us and they're going to make sure if they can get rid of you, they will, you know, and, and that might be coming. I mean, you might in the next 20 to 30 years, you may be talking single pilot operations. Yeah. You may be talking no pilot operations. I mean, well, you talked to Airbus, Airbus just uh, put that video out, right? Where they at the airplane yeah. took off flew and then landed itself completely with uh and, the, and they had the other pilots there but i don't think they touched anything did they well i mean in fairness you I mean you can do that now with most aircraft it, yeah. it's it's the really the pilot is not there for you know the the mundane tasks it's it's for when things go wrong when something breaks you know that's yeah. that that's when you want sully up there you know when <laughs> that's you, right you take a flock of geese you know and, and lose both engines that's when you want somebody who's flown f4s and right. who's got the experience you know you don't want you know, Hal taking over and going, well, does not compute. No one, <laughs> That's right. You know. you know, I, you know, not to elaborate, but I, you know, I, um, I think it's going to be so long before, even if the technology allows it, like you're saying, I, I think it's gonna be so long before people just in general are going to go, yeah. you know, okay, I'm going to get in that airplane. I mean, even 
I, I don't know, you probably even more than me because you fly 737s and air, you know bigger airplanes and jets and fighter jets. Even me, just being a general aviation guy, I've never, my size, I've never been able to fly. I, I tried getting in the Navy to fly, but they're like, you're six, you're six foot eight. <laughs> you're, not, <laughs> you're, not, you're not gonna be a pilot, um, right? So I said, well, the F you, and, oh, so, you know, sorry, my that people. You know, I said, <laughs> you know, like you said, make them say no, right? So I got, you know, I got my pilot's license on my own right after that, because I was like, oh, I'm gonna do it myself then. Um, yeah. So um, I didn't know where I was going with that, but so, so I, I, oh, I remember this. So even, um, you know, nowadays I always have this, this thought like, you know, man, if, if somebody tries hijacking that plane and takes out the pilots, I'm six, eight, I'm going up there, I'm, I'm laying waste and then I'm going to fly the airplane, you know? Um, I can't imagine if it's a computer. It's not a 737 because you will be cramped. <laughs> yeah, I've heard 737s are, are pretty rough to fly the a little worst. bit. So, yeah. <laughs> the worst cockpit. I mean, it is a Boeing 707 cockpit with some updated screens. You're like, what? when do you, you couldn't update this in the last 60 years? <laughs> that's right. That's right. The, the AV, we, we have our aviation systems and our 182 Cessnas at CAP are high, have better capabilities yeah. than, than some of these 737s. So, Man, listen, hey, I really appreciate it. I don't want to keep you too long because we've already been talking for a long time. I don't want to butcher your whole night. So, um, hey, listen, I just really do appreciate you, you know, um, you know, taking time uh, talking to us. And, um, you know, good luck with everything you're doing. And yeah. I know I personally am going to be following your, your helicopter journey because um, I just think that's fascinating. Again, being six foot eight, I don't know if I can fly helicopters. <laughs> I, I might be too big for them. You, I don't know. You'd have to, well, Jimmy Graham did, uh, yep. but he had to fly the R-44. Okay. Yeah. So the, you're talking another 200 bucks an hour. So it's like five oh, fifty, I think an hour. Yeah. I'll talk to my right. wife first about getting a 172. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I really, again, really thank, I hope uh, people go check you out. So man, thanks so, so much. And I uh, appreciate you joining. Yeah. Thanks for having me on the channel and uh, donate to folds of honor. Uh, it's a worthy cause. Yeah. I'm really glad that we had a chance to talk about that um, because I thought that was something totally different and, it, and I'm really glad we talked about that. So I will actually throw a link in the description directly to Folds of Honor as well. Um, Any of my videos have, and you might be able to add this to yours too. Yep. You can add a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. If you go to any of my videos, you click on the donate. You can donate directly on, from the video. Okay. I'll take a look at that um, because, you know, we, we, we help out with um, Reese Across America. So that's mm -hmm. something that we do to help with those types of things. But, um, but Folds of Honor would definitely be right up our alley. Um, and yeah. it's so worthwhile. So... Yeah, anybody that's um, you know looking for a good cause, and you know what? There's so many. Not to waste your time. There's so many. There's so there's so many. You know, um, volunteer. You know, uh, give us money type stuff out there that you know they take your they take your hundred dollars and ninety five dollars goes to the CEO and five dollars yeah. actually goes to the organization. Definitely not the case with Folds yeah. of Honor. They are a they very well run veteran run charity. Great group of people locally. I mean, they're in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. you know, great folks. Yeah. So anybody's looking for a good organization that can really help, um, especially with everything that's going on nowadays. So that would really be a great organization. So, all right, man, thank you so much. Really appreciate you. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. All right. And that was our discussion with C.W. Lemoyne. Uh, again, we mentioned it a few times, go check out his YouTube channel, go check out his books. Um, I learned something. I didn't realize he was so, uh, I didn't realize he had that many books. Um, so I'm gonna go check out his whole series. So that's pretty cool. Um, also, if you wanted to, we have a couple of new things. This is new for us in Civil Air Patrol here for me. Um, and we're trying to help out with COVID. And so we do have a brand new Twitter. Um, I kind of joked, I think I got my third follower today. I was very excited. And so if you want to follow us on Twitter and be the fourth follower, it's going to be at aerospace underscore live. Um, the YouTube channel, which is where most of our stuff kind of sits, is uh, youtube.com slash Robert Roberts. A name so nice, we used it twice. Um, and then we have our the podcast, um, which is aerospace dash live. So Twitter, it's underscore live podcast, it's dash live. And of course, if you are interested in joining Civil Air Patrol, want to learn more about it, uh, whether you're younger from 12 uh, to 18, or if you're a senior member, uh, you can visit gocivilairpatrol.com and learn more about us. With that, hope everybody has a great night. See y'all. Bye. Hey, I hope you've enjoyed that video. If you did, please do me a favor, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button if you want to see more content. Up here on the left-hand side, you're going to see another video from our, uh, this playlist. And if you click down here, you're going to see another video on our channel. Hope you guys all have a great day. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.